the lines were just nonsensical. I'm just literally reading lines out loud and we're trying to figure out like what it could mean. We just kept seeing the word might. We realized that might was a character's name. So it's like the equivalent of me like go, going through a game and yelling, Larry! So we're talking about two fictitious characters. Think, uh, think this about, is, man. This is what, this this is what nerds do, you. man. I mean, just, yeah, you gotta think about fact, dude. Come on, like you gotta be realistic here. Like, what's the deal with him punching boulders? And then I sit down and go, but it's the boulder punching that was yeah. just a bridge too far for everyone. This You're watching convention coverage. Sunday morning, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. That's why. The presents, the third of the day, I think, already. Really? But my final. Third and final. Third and final. Out there yes. signing autographs. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. But hey, you gotta go fast. <laughs> Sugar. I figured, I mean, if you guys are, does, does, does anybody in here not know who I am or what I do or why we're all here at SAC Anime? Okay, good. If good. you guys want, right on. That would be super awkward for you. Like, Question: What are your preferred chili dog toppings? Like a chili jalapeno, dog toppings, like a onions. What's your preference? I so I honestly, chili's got enough going on. I mean, Very obviously, you got to throw on a little bit of cheese. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some some scallions or some. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't, it's not going to go. I don't want to go like straight onions because mm -hmm. chili's already got enough onion going on in it. Uh, no, I would say just I would say just just a little bit of cheese and maybe some scallions, right? Like sounds perfect. That is yeah. now my recipe. <laughs> that is that is now your recipe. That's what I'm gonna. Well, go shoot, through. I should have said things like 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 I'm raw pancake either. batter and <laughs> gravy or something. If Little I knew that you were gonna be using this as your recipe, I'd be like, oh, um, a little bit of like uh, horseradish and uh, horseradish and chili would be amazing. Horseradish yeah. and just raw pancake batter, yeah. uncooked. Perfect. Don't, yeah, exactly. I'll try both of those options. Thank you. And uh, some gravy and a little. Little bit of uh, no, actually half a bottle of uh, what is it? Uh, Tapatio. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and then some sriracha, but Love three her. bottles of sriracha on top of that. All right. Exactly. And then roll that inside of a pizza. <laughs> batter that with some of the leftover pancake batter. Deep fry that. Freeze it. Add powdered sugar and chocolate on top. Like a Monte Thank Cristo. You. Yes. Incredible. Perfect. Enjoy the diabetes. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> You're, you're going to love it. That. So, and the heart much. disease and everything else I've just given you in one meal. Yeah. So Good chili, question. chili, beans or no beans? Uh, it just depends. Uh, it just depends. Real I, chili uh, has no beans. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. I like chili without beans. Yeah. I can't stand the huge, big red bean yeah. things that are yeah. like, yeah, they look like horse pills. Uh, yeah. My yeah. question specifically is Ezio versus Ninja Batman, who's going home with the trophy? Oh gosh, the trophy for what? Like zaniest, like weird use of monkeys in a film. Uh, that would be that would definitely go to Batman Ninja. Uh, I don't believe Ezio's had any sort of use of monkeys in in his career. Um, who's uh, that have knocked the other one out first? Yeah. Uh, so the safe answer on this is always that uh, that's too much awesomeness to be contained <laughs> in one vicinity at the same time. Therefore, a huge hole in the space time continuum would open up <laughs> and all matter and life as we know it would cease to exist. So we could never have those two characters be together like that ever again. But uh, Batman. I don't know. I don't know. Batman. He's saying Batman. Batman. Like, it's just like, no, I got to go with the first answer. I got to say like, well, who do you think? And why? <laughs> this is like the Who Would Win show. It's it's kind of like you know, like you got you got to uh, support your argument. Ooh, well, both have had plenty of years of training. Both are proficient with an array of weaponry. Uh, although I think Batman might have the quicker reflexes. Than really? NCO. So I would think that Batman would get the first hit in. Although the last one, uh, I'm gonna flip a coin on that one. It's <laughs> tough because you got to look at it and go like, well, Batman exists in a time that's far later. Yes. You know, in history. Again, I love that we're talking about two fictitious characters. Think, uh, think this about, is, man. This is what, this this is what nerds do, do I man. Mean, yeah, you got to think about fact, dude. Come on. Like, you got to be realistic here. Like, Ezio like, was in, like, the 1400s, bro. So, like, his technology was, like, hidden blades were, like, what is that? You know, like, wow, you can hide things? Like, metal? What? And then Batman's got, like, x-ray vision and stuff. And, you know, and he flies with his cape and things. And, you know, all Ezio does is fall from roof tops and land in piles of hay and survives somehow <laughs> so if we're being realistic no i honestly think uh, it's an unfair fight i think i think batman would i mean batman could just like call in a drone strike you know like 
<laughs> you know, whereas Ezio is like, Ezio had to whistle to get his friends to, you know, yeah. to do stuff. Whereas like Batman just goes, Alfred, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and, and if we're talking yeah. like Adam West Batman, he's probably got like Ezio repellent in his, yes, in his exactly. In his, yeah. Bat yeah. Ezio repellent. <laughs> Although, if we're talking about Adam West Batman, then then it would definitely go to Ezio because Adam West Batman had to like throw a grappling hook all the way up there and like climb like this slow, and Ezio was just like. And he always had to interview celebrities while he was climbing. I don't know, yes, like, exactly. Sammy That's Davis Jr. would pop out. Always. Or, yeah. What are you doing here? Yeah. No, I think uh, my first answer was the safest one, <laughs> and it's canon from here on out. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. A hole in the space-time continuum. Exactly. What, was it, what was it like playing Chris Redfield? Fun. Next question. No. <laughs> uh, it was awesome. It was honestly, that was the first, like, big video game character that I had voiced. And it was, uh, and it was so early on in my career. And I was literally, it was Liam O'Brien and Stephanie Shea were uh, the voice directors on the project. And Liam was cracking up because one day, I'd been working on it for like a couple weeks. Uh, and it was a long process, too, because we were also doing facial motion capture back when you had to glue these little reflective dots on your face, and they would always fall off, and the client kept asking me to do bigger facial expressions, you know, because they wanted to use the camera work for that, and I was, it, so it's like I was trying to do voice acting stuff where they wanted, like, subtlety from your character, but they also wanted giant facial expressions to go with it, and it's like, so you're trying to, you know, deliver a line where it's like, you know, it's over, Wesker, you know, whatever it might be. But they wanted, like, it's over, Wesker. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I can't do that. Because um, they're like, oh, bigger, bigger. Go bigger with your eyes, bigger with your mouth. And I'm like, I'm voice acting. I can't do the same thing. Um, but I was halfway through, like, the sessions, and I looked up at Liam, and I was like, this is a pretty big franchise, right? Like, Resident Evil's, like... This is going to be like a pretty big game because I, I was thinking like, man, Resident Evil 5. I'm like, we're on to five. Like, how big could this game be? You know, and, and he just looks at me. He goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, it's going to be very big. And I was like, ah, OK, cool. So it was it was just kind of not knowing what things were going to be like because uh, it came out in 2009. But I had like a big 2009 because it went from that to, um, yeah, RE5 was 2009. AC2 was 2009. Um, like all these things just kind of happened like, like all at once. And then suddenly it was just like, wow, what, what on earth has just happened here? I was happy to just keep doing any, any old voiceover job here and there. I was just having a great time, like, like getting work and suddenly earning money and feeling like independent in life. And I was like, Oh, well this, this is cool. This will work. Uh, but then all of a sudden it was like, Oh, and I get to be a part of things that might be bigger than I could have ever imagined. And so, yeah, it was just exciting and unknown, uh, and, and a lot of work at the same time. It was a long day. They were eight-hour voiceover sessions, which is, uh, we don't do those anymore because it's just like, it's a long time standing there in a booth and screaming and yelling and punching boulders and all that Boulder stuff. Boulder punch was the best moment in the entire It was. I, I've, I've been told that in uh, RE8, they refer to uh, Chris Redfield as that boulder-punching a-hole. So <laughs> it's like, well, that's lovely. That's lovely. We've, we've established a legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, to this day, we remember Resident Evil 1. Just the line that sticks in the head is, it's blood. It's blood. I hope it's not Chris's blood. blood. <laughs> <laughs> Acting. Yes. It looks like blood. <laughs> Although I will uh, say this, on, oh, along those lines, I know, sorry, I'm going to, if you want to hear, uh, there's a, a website called Audio Atrocities, and I'm sure RE1's probably on there for all I know, but it's this website that's dedicated to like horrible voice performance in games, um, or just in cartoons and things like that, and before... Uh, Resident Evil 5 for me. Before I got that, I, w I lived down in Orange County, was where I grew up, and so I started my voiceover career down there. And there was a little studio. Uh, are you looking it up? I'm gonna look oh, it up. Oh, it's gonna be great. Uh, we'll have to play a couple files. Um, and so uh, there was a little studio that was down there in Tustin, and, uh, and the, the engineer called me up on like a Friday at 4.30, and he's like, bro, are you in town? I'm like, yeah, and he's like, could you get down here? We have, a, we have to finish up a, a voiceover, and I was like, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. And so I hop in the car, drive down there, I get there, I'm like, what are we doing? He's like, it's a video game, and it's a, it's a translation video game, so we're just coming like, from another language into English, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I'm like, what is this? And it was known as, and look up Castle Shikigami 2, uh, and I don't even oh, know if there was an actual Res Castle Resident Shikigami Evil 1. Resident Evil 1 number th is number three on number the list three. of the top there you five. Go. <laughs> let me see. Let me, I just want to find, let me see if I can find a good... Uh, Resident Evil 1 director's cut is... Number oh, three. Castle Shikigami 2 is number four. Ooh. So, yeah, we're, we're in the top five <laughs> twice. Uh, no, not that I was in RE, uh, RE1, but uh, let me see if I can find. So what I was going to say is 
along the lines of like, it looks like blood. So this engineer calls me up on a Friday. He's desperate. There's no director. They haven't had a script supervisor or anything like that. The script has been translated into, I think, three different languages before it got translated into English. So I think it went from something like Japanese into Korean, might have even gone into Chinese, and then back to English. And so the lines were just nonsensical. They were, because a direct translation just doesn't work for, for the English language. It's like so many different languages have different sentence structure and all that kind of stuff. So the, <laughs> the director, my engineer friend, is just like, yeah, we're just, we just got to get these lines recorded. And I'm like, okay. And I have no context, no idea what I'm saying. I'm just literally reading lines out loud and we're trying to figure out like what it could mean. And at one point we just kept seeing the word might with an excla exclamation mo uh, point on it. And, and we were like, what is might? What is this? Why does it keep saying might? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe it's like a battle cry. Like it's a, like it's something like you do like before you throw a flame ball or something. We were like, I don't know. It's like, you know, might. So we just kept saying it that way. We we're like, might. And, and, and then at the very end of the session, when it was too late to go back and fix everything, because he was just like, dude, we just got to send it to the client and be done with it. We realized that might was a character's name. <laughs> so it's like the equivalent of me like go, going through a game and yelling, Larry, you know, like Larry over and over and over again. But this is a site that's dedicated to the worst audio performances on earth. And that looks like blood. We had no context. It, like literally my character was like Kim to John of seven homes and two moms. And we were like, what is that? He goes, I don't know. Just read it. And like, I'm Kim to John of seven homes and two moms. And he's like, cool, moving on. It was, <laughs> Check out audioatrocities.com. It's hilarious. You will hear like, and it's like, that's how things can happen too. You just go, that was just, they paid me probably 50 bucks to do that. Wow. And I, I remember it like he, he called me like a month later. He's like, it's out. I'm like, what? He's like, the game's out. And I'm like, what? Like already? And he goes, yeah. He's like, I think it's on sale at Target. And so I go to Target and it was literally already in the $10 like bargain bin. <laughs> like the pile of CD-ROM games that were just in the bargain bin. It was like brand new <laughs> came out. It's like, there it is. You're literally in a pile of a game. <laughs> Sorry, your question. Had to get through that. <laughs> it looks like blood. Blood. <laughs> I hope it's not I Christmas. accept. I am Kim of seven homes and two moms, or seven moms and two homes, and it's just like, whatever. Yeah. To circle back to Chris. Yes. I was wondering, uh, and I, I imagine they maybe had to preface it with the words, hear me out, but when it came to the boulder <laughs> punch, no, what was their explanation me. of, you're going to be in a volcano <laughs> <laughs> fighting a man with a giant mutated arm yes. and punching a boulder? Yes. What was the direction for that, considering it was hybrid mocap and vocal? So honestly, by then, I don't know that we were still doing facial motion capture. We might not have been. Usually when they start saving grunts and efforts and things like that, they'll put it towards the end of an actual voiceover session because there's only so much screaming and yelling you can do before you just damage your voice for the day and you got to go home and just do nothing for like three days to let it rest. So I don't remember if we were doing some of the facial motion capture and I honestly don't even recall if in this moment, it, it does strike me that like Liam probably would have been like like asking the clients like what what is this why do we need another punch like what is the punching sound what is he hitting and they probably would have been describing with translations and all that kind of stuff like you know he's punching a boulder and and, he, and I could just see Liam turning to me and going like you're punching a boulder like how big is this boulder Liam like what is the site because we very often operate with no context it's all theater of the mind somebody says you see this or you see that so I will say this. I would have treated it just like any other other sort of a a, um, a punching sound. I would have just been like, all right, well, <clears throat> you know, like, is that what we want kind of thing? You know, is it a two-part thing? Is it a wind-up and a punch? Is it an impact? All this stuff. We would have done that. Here's what I don't get, and at least you've alluded to this. There's nothing funnier to me than the fan base that sits there and constantly comes up and goes like, what's the deal with him punching boulders? And then I sit there and I go, you've been playing the entire game. There are giant tarantulas. There's like, you know, Wesker standing in a field of lava with a giant arm and screaming, crash, you know, and it's like, but it's the boulder punching that was yeah. just a bridge too far for everyone. This is where you that's can't suspend part. disbelief. Yeah. That's the part. That's why it's like, dude, that's so fake. And you're like, <laughs> that's the part that you just go like, wait a minute. Like, that's why? What is it? Yeah. It's honestly, I didn't know half the stuff. And since it was all that, like, since it was just like the entire game is just silliness like that. It's like, I just was like, all right, here we go. And my job is to do what they want me to do. So yeah, I probably didn't give it a second thought other than just, so it's a boulder this time. Okay. You know, <laughs> I just said things like, I need an egg. 
you know, like 500 times and, you know, I need an herb. You know, it's like, much obliged. Thanks. You know, so yeah. No, I mean, a punch a boulder? Sure thing. Yeah, because that's following out of falling out of a moving plane and fighting a man who catches a rocket launcher at point blank. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. See, like, I'm going to use that one from here on out as well. The guy caught a rocket launcher. <laughs> Was it an RPG? Just like, psh. No. Yeah. Crash. Without sunglasses coming off as well. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Which anybody who's ever done anything like, you know, how often have we all come close to dropping our sunglasses in the toilet, right? <laughs> so let alone while catching an RPG in flight. And still the glasses are on. It just doesn't make any sense. But yeah, punching boulders. Fake. Go ahead. That's fine, guys. All right. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> I would start every just so picture this. I would start every single Resident Evil 5 session off this way. Uh, Michelle and Eddie are here. Michelle Ruff. Uh, Eddie, her better half, uh, was our engineer on RE5. And my favorite thing to do in the mornings was because, and I didn't know what, I honestly, like, I look back on that time and I was just like, I was, again, I was directionless. I didn't know what I was doing. I would start every session. So Eddie would come in. I was in a separate booth and they were all the clients and Liam and Stephanie and Eddie. They were all in this other room, the control room with the glass and all that. So you have the, the clients from Capcom that are there that are, that are you know, uh, you've got translators. It's this whole thing. And I would get there, you know, it's like drive hour and a half in the morning, two hours in the morning to get to this place. I'm just like, uh, and I'm like, I got to wake up. I got to get ready to go. Sitting there, the makeup, getting all these things glued to my face, all that stuff. Okay, we're ready to roll. So Eddie comes in, adjusts the microphone, that kind of thing. He usually has to drop it down because I'm so tall. Uh, so he drops the mic down in front of me, that kind of thing. We get squared away, all that stuff. And then he leaves the room. And what I know is when he leaves the room, he's going to go back in there. And eventually every engineer just kind of walks back in the room. They're getting ready and they slide the microphones up so everybody can hear. Because while they're in there making adjustments, they turn all the microphones down so that it doesn't make all that noise. So when he would walk in there, I would just start, knowing that the microphone was off, I would just start every session off going. <laughs> and uh, the best part was that Eddie would always slide the microphones kind of loud. And so I would watch like the Japanese clients from Capcom, <laughs> Liam O'Brien, Eddie, like all of a sudden Eddie, because they'd be all like in there. And then I just watch Eddie's hand slide the mics <laughs> of him not realizing and just blaring into their speakers in the control room would be this grown man going. <laughs> you know, yeah. And that's how we would start every Resident Evil 5 session off. <laughs> and then we would punch boulders, you know, it's like a, it's a living. So the thing about the Sonic fan base is that just about anything can become a meme. Of course. How well educated are you in the stuff before Sonic Colors? Oh, gosh. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, because so many things are coming out now. I mean, there's, there's entire memes that are dedicated to Knuckles, apparently. And it's like, yeah, it's a whole thing. So I, I don't know that I'm all that familiar with. But I, I would imagine, since this is a setup, you're about to let us know about a meme that existed before Sonic Colors. I actually didn't think of it. Oh, wow. Really okay. Like no, uh, I, I mean, honestly, uh, I, I guess, it's, I mean, Sanic. <laughs> Go with Sanic, which is one of my favorites. And I love the fact that they brought that back and made that an actual thing that you could buy as a licensed like shirt from <laughs> Sega, an actual Sanic shirt. I have three of them because uh, I bought those immediately. I was like, I want a small, a medium, and a large because I don't know which one's going to fit, but I'm going to get one of those. Yeah, I try to wear those when I do like the virtual podcasts and things like that. Okay, I guess all you. podcasts are virtual. Hopefully my anything. question wasn't too off-putting. No, it was not off-putting. It was very no, on-putting, as, as Mike Pollock would have joked. Uh, <laughs> if you or Sonic are a metalhead, what metal band would Sonic listen to? I mean, Crush 40 already. Hell yeah. When you think about it, I mean, it's like, uh, I mean, it kinda, they're kind of metal. I mean, like, in my opinion, I guess. We, we, uh, I got to meet those guys at the 25th anniversary. Oh, nice. And, uh, and it was neat. And it was just so brief backstage and all that kind of stuff. And to this day, I'm like, oh, I want to get back to another time when those guys get to, we get to do something again, hopefully at like the 50th anniversary or something. That'd be kind of nice. Hell yeah. I'd love to Hello, see how someday. are you? You got to go fast. <laughs> uh, oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, gosh, it would, I mean, it would be speed metal for sure. It Hell would have yeah. to be speed metal. There you go, speed metal. Hey, even better. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, it would be speed metal, right? And is there Hell a yeah. blue, like Blue Oyster Cult wasn't metal. I'm no. trying to think of blue. There's no hedgehog metal bands that I'm aware of, so. All right, rock on. Thanks, man. Thank you, man. Rock and roll. So what inspired you to become a voice actor? Money. 
<laughs> quite literally. Uh, and let me let me elaborate. Uh, I was doing. I mean, my God, I was directionless in my twenties. I had no clue what I was going to do. I was all over the map. I was I graduated high school. I didn't take the SATs, so I didn't go to a four-year university or anything like that. Right out of, I started trying to go to junior college. I hated it. Dropped out of junior college. I started working as a production assistant in Hollywood for just production companies and doing horrible things. And then I was like, joined a band. I was, I'd been playing the drums since I was like 15 and uh, started working with a singer. And then she, we started doing albums and things, but it was just all kind of all over the map. And it wasn't really, she wanted to sign a contract and just went, thought she was going to make money getting paid to record records. And it doesn't work that way. So all over the map, finally got a really serious girlfriend at the time. And I thought, all right, I need to settle down and get ready to, you know, so I think I need to go back to school. So I going back to junior college, all that kind of stuff. Then that relationship uh, ended, and then I matriculated to a four-year university for the last two years of my career, or my college career, I should say, but discovered stand-up comedy in the meantime, started doing stand-up. I had been a theater kid when I was younger. All that stuff's going on. Uh, and then eventually, because I was doing voices and characters in my act, and I'd done it for about five years with stand-up, and I was hearing more and more people in the industry that would just keep asking me about, you know, oh, are you, are you, because you'll, with stand-up, you inevitably start like emceeing events, you host like a charity function and then you do some light you know humor before and after the show that kind of thing and people would say oh are you a radio guy like what's you know you, you sound like you have a nice speaking voice or did you take toastmasters you know what's your thing like and so you keep hearing people say like oh i'm responding to your voice and like you do characters and voices are you in cartoons and like no 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 and then eventually i was trying out for the aspen comedy festival there were 10 of us at the improv in irvine that were selected to perform we perform the audience leaves we go back up on stage and the woman that was there from the festival was there to evaluate us gives us critiques in front of our peers on stage. And she said, you, this, you know, blah, blah, blah. She gets to me and she says nothing about my stand-up and says, who represents you for voiceover? And I went, uh, nobody. And she goes, huh, you do so many characters and voices in your act. You should look into it. And then moved on. But she didn't say, your comedy's brilliant. Keep doing it. You know, like, she, and I was like, okay, there's another industry professional. That's like as good as it gets is having somebody like that who sees comics all day long, not respond to my comedy, but go, this guy would be great in cartoons. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to take that and, and, and run with it. And so I started just Googling. Back then it was probably Ask Jeeves or Alta Vista. <laughs> um, and started looking into like, you know, this, this as a thing and realized, huh, okay. And, the, and I signed up for a class, took a class. I called a couple agencies, asked them, what do you guys want? And somebody, oh, you got to go take a class. Okay, I'll take a class. I signed up, took a class and voice, voice acting for actors, part one kind of a thing. Did that and uh, and then just realized, oh, it's kind of like running your own little business and started doing that and uh, and fell in love with it because it was it, by then I had graduated college. I was kind of not really liking stand up all that much anymore and just thought, all right, where does this go? And suddenly it was like I took another class at a, at a place where the guy that ran the class was the owner of the studio and he hired me to come in and do like a training video. My first official paid gig was a training video for dialysis nurses. Um, yeah, nurses who specialize in dialysis treatments and machines. And this guy was taking all these licensed film clips and like having me do voices over it to train these nurses. And it was like silly and funny and over the top. And dialysis I got, and you. Yes, but it was like all characters and stuff. It was like, you know, Yoda, you know, like doing weird <laughs> things for this stuff. And yeah, it's like dialysis you have, you know, like <laughs> uh, it's just a so weird, you know, the blood we must clean. Um, so I was doing all these different things. And then uh, they gave me like 75 bucks at the end of it. And I just remember like walking out going, no way, you know, cause I was, I mean, I would make $75 working at Zito's pizza, delivering pizzas for six hours on a Friday night and feel like I was on top of the world, you know, and suddenly I did 30 minutes of work for this guy. I made 75 bucks and I was like, okay, I want to do that again. And so it was money. It was like, all of a sudden it was like, I can make money doing this. Whereas like screenwriting, I was in development on a screenplay, but it was like meeting after meeting after meeting and rewrite after rewrite and hours and hours and hours staying up late, stand up comedy. Like, you know, you fly out to Indianapolis to do a week out there and you're going to make 500 for the week, but your flight cost you 350 bucks. The flight was late on Wednesday night. So they dock you 75 bucks because you couldn't make it to the first show. And then just buying your food while you're out there, it's like you, you come back and you're like, well, that cost me $112. <laughs> like, at least I was funny, you know, like to, to, to people in Indianapolis, like, what am I doing? So the idea was just kind of like, I need to make some money. I need to figure out if this is a viable way. And just, it was everything that I loved about everything that I was studying, everything I'd been doing. It's me, it's a microphone, kind of like stand up. I want to entertain the people on the other side of the glass. I want to move them. It doesn't have to be funny all the time, but it's great if it is. Um, and then just the, the storytelling aspect of like incorporating screenwriting training, all that, and kind of understanding storytelling that much more from that being the studies, that kind of thing. And, and then it paid. 
And I was like, I will do this. Ah, thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Well, what was it like working on Goody Tama? Oh, Goody Tama. That was so much fun. Uh, Colleen and I had no idea what Goody Tama was. I didn't even know. Literally, Studiopolis, which was the, uh, the, the company that was sort of producing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the dub, uh, reached out and they just said, hey, we have this thing that we'd like to, to, to offer you if you'd be interested kind of thing. And I remember saying, is it a union job? You know, like if it's union, we'll do it kind of thing. And sure enough, it was. And so we were like, okay. Yeah. And all of a sudden it was like, I just Googled what Guditama was. And I was like, what? I'm like, it's a little egg yolk with a butt crack. I was like, yeah. sign me up. You know, <laughs> I was born to play this role. Uh, no, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a challenge too, because um, I kept thinking that the original actor, and I, and I, I apologize, I don't know his name. He's the creator of the show, I believe. Uh, or of the of the actual like series the 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 like the whole the whole uh, franchise if you will uh, I thought for sure that his voice was altered and that kind of thing and I don't know for a fact if it is or isn't because he does a ton of the voices in Gudetama. Do you know him? I don't. Okay, I, I, I thought you were say, anticipating. I know that uh, Colleen O'Shaughnessy, her Saki Pio voice, yep. they. They had her sing one of the songs at a lower pitch, and then yep. they raise it afterwards. That would make sense, because to sing in that high pitch voice would be almost did, impossible. Did, did they alter your voice at no. all? No. So that's what happened about maybe 30 minutes into our first session. I kept listening, and I kept listening to the original actor, and I kept kind of going, you know what? Because uh, we were doing something like, we were doing something a little more tiny and something like this. And I just said, like, I don't, I don't think it's just like the texture's not there and it's just not, right. it's not as apathetic and it just doesn't. And I, I felt like, you know, doing this this time, huh? Yeah. This time, huh? And so we were trying to hit these weird kind of like weird notes. And I thought, well, this sounds a little closer to what's going on without us having to alter it. Cause they're like, we're not going to alter your voice. And I went, all right, then we'll just do this. But so I honestly didn't know. And then of course I just fell in love with it. The more I got to be familiar with the project, I was like, this is adorable and weird and wonderful. And I mean, I mean, Colleen's doing such a, 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 a perfect job with this adorable little character. So yeah. So you like doing Goody Thomas voice? Yes. I should have just said that. I like doing Goody Thomas voice. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Good thanks. question. Thank you. The question is, what can you tell me about Chevy Ram truck month? Oh, it's uh, it's actually it's not Chevy Ram, it's Dodge Ram, but it's actually not Dodge Ram, it's just Ram trucks. So uh, this is for those of you who don't know, this is another part of my job. I've done it for maybe 13 years now, um, which is just insane. Um, so I am not. I, I for a while I was when it was uh, Sam Elliott, the the old cowboy. Oh, God, yeah, yeah, Sam yeah. Elliott. There's a voice. Sam Elliott was the voice of Ram. When. Beef. Uh, which what's for dinner? Do you have to curse so dang much? Uh, uh, which is uh, yeah, Big Lebowski. Love that. We were just talking about Roadhouse last night. Oh my gosh! Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, because they're making another one, like they needed to. No, that's, that's an insult to Swayze. It is. Uh, no, uh, so I I am the regional. I was the regional branding voice in California when it was Sam L.A. because they were like he's too cowboyish. Uh, but I, I am the guy that comes on it as the uh, uh, the retail voice. So you'll you'll hear like you know somebody saying like it takes a farmer to build you know whatever, and you know and and love is what makes a Subaru a Subaru and all that. Cause so you got your branding voice, and then I'm the guy that comes on at the end and says right now, well qualified lessees can lease the all new 2023 Ram 1500 for 479 a month. <laughs> so that's the uh, that's what it's like. But yeah, that's been a gig. That's just been like one of those things where you just go, what on earth? You know, the Sonic fans will remember me from doing Pizza Hut because they're like, it sounds like your Sonic voice when you're doing Pizza Hut. And it's like, any pizza, any size, any topping, just eleven ninety nine only at your Pizza Hut or wherever it was. <laughs> and you have to uh, talk at like 240 words per minute. When oh, my gosh, about, yes. Like, the it's, side it's, effects of pills. And it's the same thing with Ram. I mean, they, that's one of the things that we get 30 seconds. They send me this stuff and it's like, oh, God, let's see if I can. Because I, I do, sometimes it's like, you know, mornings, a typical day for me starts with a session for Ram uh, because the you do these regional business centers for these these dealerships all across the U.S. And so you'll you'll have like multiple commercials for different regions and the radio ones are always the worst because you've got to cover all of the legal copy at the very end of it. And so it's always like, uh, what is it like? Uh, it was like Ram Truck Month. Like It was like, hurry into Ram Truck Month and discover what it truly means to drive a truck that's built to serve. Ram Truck Month, going on now. And right now, well-qualified returning FCA lessees can lease the all-new 2023 Ram 1500 Quad Cab 4x4 for four seventy nine a month for three forty six down and no, no tax title license extra. And then it's like, <laughs> what is it? Uh, and then it says, uh, call one eight seven seven ram 5722 for details. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's... Uh, 
$3,000, what is it? No, no, sorry. 0.9% APR financing equals 0.9% APR financing equals 0.9% APR financing equals thirteen eighty nine per month per 1,000 finance regardless of down payment. Not all buyers will qualify. Residence jurisdictions apply. Take retail delivery by eleven three twenty nine. 329 It's just like that sort of thing. You do like all in one breath. No, no, thank you. But that's, that's coffee in the morning. <laughs> that is just go, 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 go. And you'll crank through like 20 of those, you know, in the first hour. And then I have usually have about an hour break. And then I start doing commercials or, or uh, cartoons or video game work after that. And then maybe a, uh, oh gosh, a promo session for Cartoon Network. I'm doing a lot of Cartoon Network's promos now. So um, all the stuff that you hear in between the shows where it's like, you know, up next, Craig of the Creek, all that stuff. Uh, that's, a, that's a day in the life of, of Roger. But yeah, okay. Ram Thank Trucks. Thank you. And well, on. So what was the inspiration for your voice of Ezio as he goes from a young boy to the uh, burly uh, older man that we know him as? Just retaining a job, I guess, hoping they would still work with me. <laughs> no, uh, that was actually, so a lot of people ask, like, why, why you for that? Uh, and, and I did ask Amanda, our director, and she said, no, we auditioned, like, authentic Italians as best we could. Like, we, we put out the casting call. We wanted... And an Italian actor to do this, but what we were looking for was age range. And they were like, they wanted one actor, the, the caveat to the casting was that they wanted one actor to portray all three different age ranges. And so they said, we have to open it up to anybody and everybody for that to be the case. Because there might be some people who come in and they have this great Italian accent and they're authentically Italian, but asking them to play young Ezio at the beginning, then sort of like Ezio in his 20s and then Ezio in his 60s was like three different things. And so that was part of the audition process was them just working with the age range. And, and that was the, what kind of sealed the deal, thankfully for me, um, was just being in there. And I walked in kind of going, do you want me to do like authentic Italian? Like, like kind of thing. And they're like, we're not really certain yet because we're, we're, we're going over from a creative standpoint on what would the language sort of cadence have been like at that time? How authentic can we be to that without it sounding off-putting um, to, the, to the Western ear? They, like literally they were worried about it. Um, and I said, well, I'm a, a MotoGP fan. So I, uh, Valentino Rossi was the world champion at the time and just was one of the most dominating riders in the entire sport. Um, but I would always study his post-race interviews and, uh, and he's authentically Italian. So for him, it'd be like, it was a very good race, uh, the bike a very fast, and uh, you know, it, a very good track, uh, the weather is not so good, uh, you know. And I'm thinking, is that what you want your protagonist to sound like? <laughs> like, a, you know, like, it's a me, it's your editor, da Firenze, you know. And I, and I was like, is that? And they're like, no. And then they were like, we're thinking a mix of like a little bit of like Spanish into it to kind of soften some of the consonants and some of those sort of, sort of hard hitting T's will play with that. So I always say, what I did was not Italian, it's Italia Spanglinish. <laughs> so it's kind of like a blend of all those three things because they wanted it to obviously be appealing to a, a broader audience, uh, which is what that would be. So, uh, but it was a blast. I mean, getting to work with, I mean, my gosh, getting to work with uh, a dialect coach and speak lines in Italian. And I go back every now and then just like, like watch a YouTube clip of my work in, a, in Assassin's Creed and just go, I can't, it's like, I said that, I did that. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry, I hope I answered your question. I don't know. I blast. Yeah, I know there's like a scene. I don't know if it was like improv or something, but yeah. I know you were like doing sounds or something. Oh, yeah. In the booth and you were like, yeah, yeah. That. I was just wondering, do you have any like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about, no. Did you have any like improv lines that you were able to do? Oh, all the time. All the time? All the time. Yeah, in fact, uh, one of my favorite lines from Boom is the moment where he's falling down, uh, Sonic's falling through the sky, and he says, I'm coming in for a hard landing, Tails, you got me covered? And Tails says, Roger. And then Knuckles, being the brilliant character that he is, goes like, who's Roger? And I look at the director, Jack, our, our, our voiceover director, Jack Fletcher, and I looked over at Jack, and he goes, go ahead. <laughs> and, I, and I just said, he's talking to me. Thanks, buddy. You know, and he, he was like, because we would break the fourth wall all the time. We lampooned the, the fan oh. base. We lampooned the cannon, all that kind of stuff. With the Roger clip, when he mentions Roger. Yes, oh, yeah. and that was me just saying, can I do my real voice? Because and, 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 <laughs> yeah. that was what the writers intended. They're like, it wouldn't have landed as funny if it was Sonic saying, he's talking to me, you know, because it's like, no, because now we, I mean, we've broken the fourth wall so many times on this show. So yeah, it was, we, we improved a ton of stuff. It was always, you know, but it was always like pulling teeth to make sure that Sega was going to approve it because <laughs> some of our improvs are not appropriate. Whoa. 
what? Because you're going to be what? <laughs> no. Thank you. Great question. I really love regular show. And I was oh, nice. You oh. Could, you could <laughs> talk about <laughs> your experience <laughs> on that show if you have a favorite episode or anything. Oh, my gosh. Uh, my favorite episode, I will say, regular show was a blast. That was seven seasons out of their eight I got to be a part of until they all blasted off in outer space and my characters didn't make it. But uh, regular show was a blast. Getting to work with Mark Hamill, that was an unbelievable <sighs> moment. Uh, and a scary one, too, because I knew that I was already doing um, uh, Batman. And I couldn't tell him that I was doing, you know, that that kind of thing. Um, but uh, and, and of course, getting to suddenly realize that I was working with Mark Hamill was unreal. Walked in late to one of my sessions, and you know, because my call time was after theirs. I walk in, there's this gentleman holding court, and you know, he's sitting down on his chair. And I was like, man, I, man this guy's telling me all these stories about like, you know, Anne Margaret and all this stuff. And he's got all these old like Hollywood stories. And and then at one point, they're everybody's kind of chiming in with little bits and pieces. But he was sitting in front of me with his back kind of toward me. And at one point he turns and he goes, Roger, right? And he goes, what do you think? And he tilts his glasses down uh, and he looks up at me and I was like, I saw Luke Skywalker's eyes. Because I can remember being like literally seven, six years old, seven years old when I saw Return of the Jedi in the theater. And I'm just like, all of a sudden I was like, uh, it would have been about that. 1983? It might have been, yeah. Yeah. So, so seven years old. Because we're the same age. I'm 47. I am too. Okay, ready to go. Yeah. I can't do math. I was like 106. No. Uh, and so, like, all of a sudden, I was like, oh, that's Mark Hamill. You know, just like, like in the middle of my session, kind of like, I'm working with Mark Hamill. You know, and then to get to do like so many sessions and to have him just know who you are and, and be like, hey, Raj, you know, you're just like, hey, Mark. <laughs> you know, like, hi, Luke. Hi, you're Luke Skywalker. Um, <laughs> But I, the, 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 the most enjoyable episode for me was, and it was really not so much the episode, but just what happened. J.G. Quintel, one of the nicest guys on earth and one of the most creative human beings and super funny, he tells me, he's like, hey, could you do um, like a voice match for us? Like, we're going to do a scratch record because we're going to get the actual celebrity to come in. And I was like, yeah, what, who, who, who do you want me to do? Because we will do that very often. If they know they've got somebody coming in, they say, hey, could you just record for us, do your best impression of that person, but not too good, and we'll animate to that. And he says, oh, yeah, it's going to be um, Jesse Ventura. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, yeah, the wrestler, right? He's like, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to get Jesse Ventura to come in, and, and he's going to play Margaret's dad. And I was like, oh, okay. And so we roll, and it's like the first line, and I start doing, unbeknownst to me, I was doing um, Randy Macho Man. So I was doing it wrong. So I started going like, oh, yeah, you know, you're going to, oh, yeah, you're going to. And he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, that's Randy Macho Man Savage. And I was like, I was like, oh, 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 I'm like the governor from Minnesota. Like the governor of uh, Minnesota who's like, you know, you know, there are black helicopters that are circling right now and your government is watching. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, what? And he's like, that's good. And all of a sudden, Chris, our director, she goes, who's doing that? You know, and I was like, I am. She's like. Let's go with that, you know? And so, uh, <laughs> so I'm doing this uh, very bad, you know, uh, version of what I thought was, uh, you know. And it, all of a sudden, there's like, this is funnier than anything we're going to get Jesse Ventura to do. And he was like, could we call Jesse Ventura's people and tell him not to bother? And she's like, yeah, I'll call him right now. And so all of a sudden, I was like, ha. I was like, take that. Take that. There's my elbow. And boom. But yeah, it was uh, just, there's so many moments on regular show where we just had way too much fun laughing way too much and it was just like one of the best gigs i've ever had was just working with those guys and cracking up every time and letting them let, let me just play you know they they just come in all the time and be like and then all of a sudden he just he, like i left a session and jg was like hey how's your uh, russian accent and i was like i don't know it's okay it's like i can lampoon it and he's like okay cool and i'm like why he's like no reason <laughs> show up to the next session all of a sudden he's, he's like here's a script and i'm like reading through i'm like thomas is a russian spy and he's, he's spoiler alert and uh and he was like yeah this whole time and i was like what and he goes yeah you know we're just having fun with the character kind of thing i was like yeah it was it was that it was just like always something new and fun and they it, they just would play around and we'd have so much fun on that show. So. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you, Roger. Thank you.